what's so special about the United Nations? How is it different from any kind of other political associations or strategic aims of the associations? Or how is it different from any other kind of international organizations that are human history or our civilization, civilizations that have in the past years? How is it different? We see it different because it has a meaning to it. It has virtues and values adapted to that organization other than just strategic, beneficial, financial, or or uh, other aims or military benefits to any kinds of other aims for China. So we have upon this enough, upon this consensus that UN is a different organization that should aim for different values other than any kind of strategic associations, we would like to open today's debate with this definition of geography, some of the key terms in today's notice. Now, UNSC or UN Security Council would co be consisting of 15 countries, five of permanent members of France, United Kingdom, Russian Federation, People's Republic of China, the United States of America. And they would be having the, these permanent members would be having the veto power, while the 10 nations would be advisory panels who can be changed due to circumstances. And this United Security uh, United Nations Security Council would be the only also the only uh, sub uh, subdivision sub the committee in the within the United Nations that could do other possible measures other than resolutions possibilities of own, the only committee that could do more things. So thank you. Such as military actions, or economic sanctions, and the only such as possible means of enforcement. And veto or being dead weight vetoes, which means that they cannot be overturned by persuasions, be overridden, or be or have to be or Thanks, be pertained, or that you pertain with that. So having that, so uh, having that, they would these nations would have nothing but to uh, but wait to wait for these nations with veto power to take their to withdraw their vetoes by themselves to overturn these vetoes. I'll be talking about the principles of the UN and second, malignant harms of the veto power. While our team's, our team's second speaker will talk about the increase in the cooperation, thank you, and cooperation and communication within the international community. And having that, let me go on to our team's first argument about the principles of the UN. Let's first look at the reason why we created the UN. Because we were simply sick of the brute forces and the barbaric rule of power dominating the world these events. The reason why the UN is so significant and so different from any other form of international organization is because, because every country was given an equal proportion of power in the decision making process. Never in our history did we have a place where countries were encouraged to make their own opinions feel thank you, whether having a weak or strong military, large or small economical scale, but just uh, the same proportion in making the decisions of over international issues. So we're trying to put an end to the barbaric ages of unilateral enforcement for the time of equality and virtue. And as you have noticed, there is one weak link within this United Nations, the United Nations Security Council. This is the sole committee that could enforce nations to follow UN measures, such as human rights issues. It is the sole committee, the strongest committee that could enforce put economic sanctions or put peacekeeping courses directly into military actions. And no other community can do that. And the, the reason why the UN has a weak link in its virtue is, is specifically because of the Security Council. Simply because these five nations ruling over the other nations have this veto power. The veto power usually Please resides stop. by the state or the head authority of a state such as the Queen or the President. And apparently, USA, UK, China, or France, or Russian Federation are not kings and presidents of the UN. Do you think this is principally wrong? Well, thank you. Because we are, first of all, first of all, admitting that there are some hierarchy between nations. Of course, we can uh, sometimes like, believe that there can be some uh, power relations or superiorities in powers, but the thing is that we're actually uh, making it in the public, we're making it in the open, and we're not doing anything to overcome these measures. But the, and we're, uh, and we, we see that there is no or any big differentiation between the nations with veto power and those with not, especially in political significance, other than the, the, the power of the country. So we believe that this is, first of all, against the equality principles of the UN, of what, what it makes us do. That makes it so special. And second, we believe that even the veto, even in the places where veto power does exist, ha, uh, also has an overriding rule 
in presidential democracies or in parliamentary democracies, even if the official head of the nation, the most powerful man and woman in the state, believes that something shall, should and should not be done, if the Congress or the parliamentary believes uh, uh, believes that such zeros should be overridden, or should be overridden, we, we, we believe that this direct representation has uh, more power than the simple action of veto, so we can override it with the direct representation of the people. Yes? What makes the UN different is that it's the only body which keeps all major powers engaged by giving them the confidence to engage with each other mm -hmm. through the people. So we see team opposition who have the serious assumption that as soon as we, these veto powers are taken away from these nations, these nations will suddenly drop down their uh, drop down their seats and uh, all the responsibilities within the UN and just say, okay, we don't have the veto power, so we won't do anything about the uh, country, uh, country's matters. Then why do we have these UK, USA, Russia Federation, and all these other by veto uh, combination with veto power participating in HRC, ECOSOC? or UNEP, or any yes, other right. kind of various committees of UN and making different uh, influences over the, over the spheres and making actually improvements in the states except for the UN Security Council. So we believe that judging from what they have been doing and what the nations without the veto power has been contributing to the UN, we believe that even without these veto powers, these what nations can them? and they will influence and improve the state of the international community. Okay, anyway, back to my argument about the, how this um, vetoing power is principally wrong. Why? Because this is deadweight power that cannot be turned over or overridden in the case of UN Security Council. In an ideal democracy, there is and should be no such deadweight power because the concentration, the accumulation of such deadweight power, whether it is abuse or not, is uh, or abuse or not is the its precise definition of tyranny just by its it, it, by, just by its existence and the potential of abusing it means that this vetoing power when it's dead weight power cannot be accepted and now I'll show you in my next argument of uh, the malignant parts of veto power of how this is not a mere potential now first of all let's understand the origins of the veto power. It is to prevent the execution of excessive power. But look at what we have right now. Instead of excessiveness, we see an impotency of power. Let's see uh, the cases in Libya and Syria. First, Libya. There was no fly zone. Okay, we admit that the UN Security Council has issued a no fly zones. So what Gaddafi did was to pancake his people with using tanks instead of bombing jet planes. But we believe that that is uh, such a great significant improvement for what the UN Security Council could have done and should have done because that was the maximum. No fly zone was the maximum thing we can't, uh, we couldn't afford with this veto system, and that was it for our people. And we left these people to be killed, and that was very irresponsible. That was directly going against why we had UN in the first place. Let's look at Syria. How these, there was a civil uprising to overrun, overrun Assad president. Now, we had a genocide right here, over 300,000 people dead, and that's the, oh, that's the official death. Also, we don't even know the unofficial death, and they actually wiped out a whole city, and what we did? Nothing, practically nothing, because two, there were two videos within these UN Security Councils, and these were both two massacres, which, uh, which, well, which was going against the main objective of the UN. So in both cases, two videos was the end of the question. No persuasion, no further negotiation, and no further available protection provided by the United Security Council. So we believe that these vetoes, without any persuasion or any justification, is actually enabling these nations to do such barbaric actions. And that is the reason why we this space motion. Alright, thank you very much for that speech, and I would now like to call upon you. Sorry if I mispronounced you. I'm not going to make more silence. Tonight, we sometimes meet them how to say no. Let's make this debate very clear. It's not a debate about the identity of the permanent members of the United Nations. It's not a debate about who they are to be to. Rather, team opposition says that in principle, veto power should exist, and we are going to prove this through three lines of argumentation. I'll prove to you that the veto keeps major powers engaged with the UN, and that the veto increases the effectiveness of the organization. 
my second speaker, we show the DeVito and powers normal nations, that's Singapore. But before we go into our constructive case, I want to ask two questions. <coughs> One, is the veto justified? And two, is the veto beneficial? And the answer to both questions is yes. So first point, on the principles of the United Nations. And here, we saw a true proposition that I will say, preaching to us about the virtues of equality and representation. We have two responses to this. First of all, other mechanisms of the UN already ensure that smaller nations have a voice. For instance, the gender exemption, when there's a one nation, one vote system. The fact of the matter is that the United Nations Security Council's role is not to ensure that every nation is represented. It is to ensure and secure international peace and stability. The urgency and the exigency of the situation is this court of party to do this means that we must be effective and that it must prioritize its ability to navigate our complex world against all else. But our second and more important response is that the veto actually contributes towards equality and representation of all nations. I come from a small country, Singapore, and we know that there's nothing natural about our current world order, that big nations are prepared to talk to smaller nations. The fact of the matter is that countries like the US and China could very well choose to split over our little red dot the next day. The only thing that keeps it in place within the United Nations system is that it knows that the UN will not be able to act against their own interests and as a consequence has a powerful incentive to remain in place. Don't be fooled by their complacent analysis about the UN Development Program or the UN FEP. These organizations do not deal with matters they are fundamental to the interests of big countries and that's why they stay involved without the UN. When it comes to something as fundamental as security or armed intervention or sovereignty for countries like Russia and China, they do not tolerate it if their veto is a bond. And that's why we say it's our side that truly stands for small nations. They revealed their fundamental misunderstanding of international relations when they talk to us about parliamentary democracies and how the veto can go on. Because the fact of the matter is that within the system of international relations, the abuse and tyranny they talk about is checked by each major power, where different powers as a check and values on each other to ensure that their power <coughs> is not used. But more important, within the parliamentary of presidential democracy, there's a guarantee of equality of every citizen. There is no such guarantee within the world, and that's why the veto is necessary to ensure that the principles of the UN are upheld. The veto is morally justified. Next, let's ask ourselves whether the veto is beneficial. And here there are one major line argument about the importance of the UN resulting from the veto. There are two responses to this. First of all, increasing the number of nations has been a willingness to embark on actions like sanctions and armed intervention. Because in the 21st century, it is important to project soft power and earn the spot of the rest of the world. If China were to veto the no fly zone in Libya as it would have, 40 years ago, they will end up being a pariah in the international community. But second and more important, we think that they have wrongly attributed these incidents to the region. So we think it's regrettable that the situation in Syria is happening right now. But the last matter, the sanction sir, is that even the United States is opposed to intervention in Syria because it knows that the civil war could be worth it if more arms go into the country. And that's why we think that the debate is an important mechanism to ensure that the power of the UN is not used to vision. I'll take you in a moment, sir. I'm now going to deepen this analysis in a constructive argument. And here, the thrust of my analysis is that the UN should be an inclusive organization of all nations, not a lame duck gathering of half the world. But before I go on to say why, yes, sir. Your analysis of the Syria situation is not true. UN Secretary, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon tried to persuade the rest of the world to participate and intervene in the situation. It's the Russia and Chinese veto that stopped the intervention of the rest of the community whatsoever. So, okay, so we have one either group man who says that intervention is a great thing. But we also have countries that the UN is In fact, the US Secretary of State come out and saying that their nation is not going to stand for intervention. We don't see how this importance that you speak of is going to be resolved in a world of unilateral action as seen by the citizens proposes. So let's move back to my case. The next link in my argument is that without the veto, there is no incentive for big states to be a part of the UN. Why? Because they have the political, economic, and military might to push their against outside the UN system. 
as such, they do not take the risk of being blinded by their interests that potentially contradict their most fundamental interests in a system where they are outnumbered by small states. We saw this with the League of Nations. In the absence of the digital power, the US refused to take part because it was afraid that sovereignty would be compromised by the organization. The result was war. And we say that's precisely how the UN is different from any other organization in history. It's the only organization that has worked. And a key component of the team work has been made. Let's look at another example of UNESCO. In 1980, the US backed the organization because it felt that its views were being jumped out by leader Eastern states. Imagine if this had happened in the bloody council. The result of international security was a disaster. We have a, need, a big power in the US outside the rules based framework of international law. And that is a prospect that we cannot accept. So, because the veto ensures that countries have got power incentives to be part of the UN system, we say that it ought to be accused. I'm now going to move on to my second argument. And here, our premise is that the Security Council possesses awesome power and responsibility. And thus, Article 9 of the UN Charter is the only body that can authorize armed intervention and sanctions. When such measures are employed, it's important to ensure that they are justified beyond reasonable doubt. The veto ensures that all major geopolitical and ideological considerations are taken into account before such drastic and extreme measures are employed. This ensures the judiciousness of the power. Now, I'm going to take this argument one step further. Student action can only be effective with the support of all major powers in the world. Intervention in Syria is going to become more bloody. If Russia continues to supply arms and helicopters to other governments, sanctions against North Korea are going to fail if China refuses to enforce such sanctions. Without the veto, the credibility and workability of UN action is compromised. My final day will show that the veto actually engenders a culture of compromise and consensus. In the world of the veto, nations have an incentive to form blocks with smaller states and choose through their views that the actual majority. By contrast, nations know that the only way they can get their way is to create broad-based support for their revenue, because the political ramifications of using the veto are just so good. That's why since the end of the Cold War, the veto has only been used three times. And that's why we say that sometimes in life, we need to learn how to say no. Singapore is trying to do in this big is that they're saying because powerful nations have a lot of influence, what the international community should be doing is to be sucking up to them because we can't earn their cooperation if we're going to do is grant them unlimited power and let them do whatever they want in terms of international issues, which goes against the principle of the UN and which we think is a wrong way to resolve the issue. And that's why on Team Korea today we'd like to propose the notion. And as a second speaker of the proposition, I'd like to move, do two things. Mainly rebut to the arguments brought by the first speaker of the opposition, and then move on to elaborate our third argument on supporting the motion we need to increase the cooperation and communication within the international community. So straight on to the rebuttals. First of all, they said about the principles of the UN that smaller nations do actually have a voice, so we don't really see any of a problem. But the problem is that the UNSC is the only committee within the UN that has any enforcement mechanisms to do something about human rights abuses, massacres, problems occurring around the world. 
And what happens if veto powers are granted to five permanent nations is that whenever these five, these five nations don't like a resolution that we reach, is that they reject them. And the smaller nations don't have any power whatsoever to overrule that. They have to comply to the five nations' power decision. We find this to be quite barbaric. And number two, what they also said was that to effectively pursue international peace, we need this veto power. First of all, there was no explanation whatsoever from their side how veto power has actually contributed in inter improving international peace. But number two, we say that it has been drastically failing. It has to be an obstacle keep of keeping an international peace. peace. Because as we can see in cases of Syria and Libya, what Russia and China did was to pursue their self-interest through this veto power, where the rest of the international community was calling for intervention to put a stop to the massacres of Assad regime and al Qaeda. And the, Russia, the only reasoning that the Russia and China had, well, we, which they actually didn't have them because they publicly didn't say anything, but what we assume the political scientists say is that because the Russia, China, and Russia and China didn't want the anti-American regimes of the Saad and Gaddafi to fall. And that's a failure of keeping international peace, we say, ladies and gentlemen. That's just a flagrant abuse of veto power, effectively pursuing the self-interest of powerful nations. How is that any help? Uh, how is that any better for the international peace? How has that been working, ladies and gentlemen? We brought you practical examples of two nations, two most current nations that massacres mm -hmm. have been happening. The UNSC has been paralyzed because of this veto power mechanism. Team Singapore has to come and explain how the veto power has uh, helped uh, in solving the situation in these two countries. Uh, in these two unfortunate nations. And they said that because powerful nations will not participate once we get rid of their veto powers, we should oppose the motion. Well, we have two levels of responses. First of all, this is a value debate. This motion clearly says this House believes that the veto power should be removed. We should be discussing about whether the veto power is truly right or wrong according to the principles of UN. We should be discussing whether it has been beneficial or harmful for the international peace circuit. And whether uh, the mechanisms of the practicality is another issue that we have to deal with. But even to deal with that, we don't understand where their logical link comes from once we get rid of their veto powers that these five nations will automatically step out from international engagement whatsoever when it's against their self-interest to be, not remain as a member of the United Nations because they, it, it's in their interest as well to keep international trade going and engage with international peace also is related to their domestic uh, will. And we also question how the major, if the concept of major power has changed over time, because these five nation memberships were granted right after World War, after World War II, when the spheres have changed, now maybe India or Japan, or Germany is more powerful than France or UK, how come they don't have veto power and they're still actively engaging within the matters of the UNSC, sir? China doesn't need the UNSC international trade code. If they really wanted to, they could invade the Strike Three Islands tomorrow and secure the entire South China Sea. It is the veto that keeps China on this negotiating table. First of all, we've heard no explanation of, on their side or proof that China specifically said oh, we're staying in the UNSC just because of the veto power rather than the engagement that we can have within the UNSC, that it needs its voice to be heard to the rest of the community, what China thinks and what, how it wants to influence the international spheres within the UNSC. Just because you don't have 100% power, uh, power over international issues doesn't mean that China would want 0% influence of every issue that occurs. We see no logical connection between that and no evidence presented from Team Singapore whatsoever. And let's say that they said that because veto power actually promotes equality within the system, it should be kept. We find this to be quite odd because we clearly told you that veto power is usually what's given to the head of state, to the president of the United States, because we think he has the authority to reject any other decisions made by the Congress. Now, we don't understand how the same kind of power logic can be applied mm -hmm. within the United Nations because we don't think United States, China, or UK can be the top of UN. We don't think there should be a hierarchy when it comes to making decisions to promote international cooperation and peace. And that's just principally wrong with the equality principle of UN. They have to answer that point. And lastly, if we were to follow their power logic, then 40% of the UN budget comes from the US and China. How come we're not giving them all their powers in ECOSOC or UNEP or other communities of the UN's, uh, UN? They're saying that just because you have no money or you have no military troops, that means that you have to be dominating the UN. 
which we don't think is why this organization was created in the first place. The organization was created to improve that kind of barbaric power group, to actually give a say to every single member of the international community, not just the powerful ones, like the United States or Russia. If their solution is to just listen to them, suck up to their powers, we think it's different. We have to pressure those powers to actually care about the rest of the international issues from the objective viewpoint and try to cooperate and communicate with the rest of the world. And also I'd like to explain how intervention will help improving situations of massacres and human rights. We think this is rather obvious because if a dictator is killing citizens drastically, if you send intervention, if you have intervention, if you send troops to so stop that kind of human rights abuse, it's actually better than doing nothing. And that's how the situation is going on in Syria and Libya. Because there was no intervention, casualties and injuries are skyrocketing without limit, ladies and gentlemen. Point, we see this as a failure, madam. When, when in the case of Syria, when the US, China, and Russia were against intervention, prove to us that in your case, intervention would actually be effective in saving lives. Yes, we think intervention will be effective because if there are soldiers to protect civilians that are being massacred by dictators, that's actually better than having no one to be protected. And we don't understand how that can even be a question when civilians have actually protection from the organization called UN and when they don't. And moving on to the third argument of how we increase cooperation and communication within the international community. I have two levels of analysis, first within the UN and next the UN with the rest of the world. Moving on to the first level of analysis, we think the five permanent members didn't listen to other countries so far because they didn't have to. They have ultimate power to decide upon issues and how US, China, Russia could remain so incredibly arrogant and selfish when deciding upon these issues was because of these veto powers. Because Russia and China could veto uh, sanctions against Syria or Libya, or uh, because China has to remain, uh, the reason that China could be uh, remain apologetic on issues about human rights abuse in Tibet, Uyghurs, were all because of this veto power. Once we get rid of that, we actually think there will be an increase of cooperation and communication within the UN because they have the incentive to persuade other nations. And for the rest of the world, we think that many parts of other world can see the UN as an organization that primarily represents the will and interest of the ones in power. And that, as long as the veto power exists, this is frankly true. And that's why Middle East, South America, or other parts of the nation is remaining reluctant to cooperate with the UN. When we get rid of this UN of uh, veto power, this is when the UN will truly start to cooperate with the rest of the world. Proposition's case reflects a naive and misplaced understanding about how the international community actually works. I'm going to show you why in two terms of perspective. First of all, is the veto power justified? Second of all, is the veto power beneficial? Under the first one, they started this debate by claiming an unfettered principle of equality within the United States. That because every nation should have an equal voice without actually putting to us why, we should remove the veto power. We told you that this fruitless certain degree, that is why we have mechanisms like the G8 and EcoSoft, where every single nation is allowed to have a voice. They came up to, uh, they came up and responded to this in the second part by saying that the UNSC is the only body which can enforce resolutions, therefore, in that body, we should have equality as well. We say precisely it's the only body which has the influence to enforce resolutions upon other members of the international community. That's why it's important to ensure that all the big powers and all the big nations in the world support these resolutions. And I'm going to be proving to you later how their site doesn't ensure this, therefore makes the UNSC completely ineffective, therefore rendering any benefit from small nations being the UNSC and having an equal voice uh, irrelevant. I'm going to evolve this argument by my first speaker one step further, right? By telling you the principle of equality isn't unfettered within the UN. It has to be balanced by the, by the principle of effectiveness as well. When we had pure unfettered equality, the League of Nations is what resulted. Where, you try, where, the, where the international community tried to give an equal weight to every single nation, that is what resulted in World War II, because nations weren't able to engage each other 
because they had no one so right. We say that therefore we must give us back the principle of equality with the principle of effectiveness as well to ensure international peace, peace and security. So, in answer to, the, to our claim about how the veto ensures international peace and security, they had two responses. First of all, they claim that we haven't explained how the veto ensures this two peace. We say, I'll explain to you now, right? First of all, we ensure that all powerful nations contribute to efforts to uphold international peace and security. For example, when there is an intervention, all the big nations that have military might contribute to this intervention, therefore making them effective. Second of all, it ensures that large nations don't sabotage each other. And I'll be giving you the examples of this in the context of the examples about Libya and Syria later on in my report. But then they told us that the UNSC has been a drastic failure in international peace and security because they failed to intervene in Syria and Libya. Once again, this, re this reflects naive and misplaced analysis. The success of the UNSC in upholding international peace and security is reflected by the quantity of interventions, whether the intervention can intervene in every single situation that they can. Rather, it is reflected by the effectiveness of these interventions. We say that more interventions doesn't result in more peace. Therefore, we say that in principle, we must balance equality with effectiveness. Next, under this point of contention, let's talk about my first opposition speakers about keep, keeping big nations engaged. They told us that, oh, there's always an incentive for these big nations to contribute because, you know, they are, uh, there's always an incentive for these big nations to contribute because of international trade. You see, first of all, you don't need the United Nations Security Council in order to, keep the, to have international trade. Second of all, big nations are not big, generous teddy bears that will do whatever you want for the international community. You see that nations are fundamentally selfish in nature. Nations just want to uphold their own self interest. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is no incentive for them to be nice and kind and generous. On that point, mm -hmm. last of all, they told us that well, China hasn't explicitly stated they're only in the UNSC because of the veto. Therefore, you know, our point is that we say they don't have to state things before we analyze them, uh, analyze this point to be true. And last of all, they told us that oh, uh, it's better for China to have some influence than to have no influence. We say if they don't have veto power, it's not good that they'll have no influence. The fact is that these nations are so large and so powerful that they have the ability to do anything they want outside the boundaries of the UNS. Because they have such powerful militaries, because they have such powerful trade kind of countries, they are able to do whatever they want outside the boundaries of the US. And that's right, we need to keep them engaged. Let's talk about the next point, right? Yeah. About, the, um, about whether the veto is beneficial. They started out by telling us about debt rate power. Let's deal with the two examples right now. First of all, they told us about Libya. We see that if the UNSC had done anything against Libya without the, the approval of Russia and China, what probably would have resulted is Russia supplying arms to Muammar Gaddafi, result, resulting in a proxy war between the USA, NATO, and, and, and Russia. We see that the fact is that if you don't keep big powers engaged, they're going to act out, outside the boundaries of your frameworks, making conflicts even worse. Second of all, for Syria, we say that's a debate for another day, but the fact is that no one has approved, no one has mooted the idea of intervention because everyone agrees that it would be bad for everyone to intervene. We say they cannot use the example for Syria anymore. Furthermore, we say that the fact is that the veto hasn't actually been used much. It's only been used three times since the end of the Cold War. Therefore, they are misattributing ineffectiveness to the veto. Last, under my reference, my first opposition speaker told me that a veto ensures compromise and consensus. They told us and that, that the only way to get resolutions passed is to engage with each other. They tried to rebut this using their proposition to substantive, which came out in 15 seconds. But we say that's just not the case, right? The veto has only been used three times in the end of the court war, and we've also given you examples of compromise and consensus. Lastly, they told us why not give powers to keep us out on the GA, etc. Et we say, first of all, because these bodies don't affect the fundamental, uh, fundamental interests like sovereignty of the big nations, but big powers will stay involved in the UNSC, will not stay involved in the UNSC without the let me move on to my substantive argument for today about how outside gives smaller nations a voice on the international class. Let's talk about let's talk about the natural world order first, right? We see that the big nations are the big bullies on the international platform. They have no incentive to listen to smaller states. The smaller states don't have the ability to affect their actions. These big nations have such powerful militaries, such large economies, and such extensive trade ties that whatever the smaller nations do, they are fundamentally unable to affect the actions of the big nations. And that is the natural world order. What the UN does to check against is that, is that it creates a platform where all nations come together to address issues. This checks against the anarchic international world order, because small nations have a platform to engage bigger nations. For example, we say that in the G8, everyone has an opportunity to vote and to speak, and in the UNSC, the 10 rotating members, uh, the 10 rotating members from various parts of the world, all the moments, have an opportunity to speak. Yes, sir. 
So what point is a GA resolution supported by small countries when the execution of such GA resolutions and the consequences are controlled by the UNSC? Isn't it making the GA resolution incompetent as well? Okay, so, so now you're taking your logic to an entirely different extreme. You're saying that any small nation should have the power to enforce matters of international peace and security whenever it wants to as well. That is the only way to keep your principle alive on your side. And we say that that's fundamentally impossible, right? You can't have every single small nation trying to enforce its ideas of international peace and security on the, on the entire world. We see that, uh, that, that, that's fundamentally ineffective because they are bound to have conflicts, right? We see that if you take that point to a logical extreme, it's not going to work out in a realistic world order. So, moving back to my concern, what happens when you remove veto power is that large nations no longer have an incentive. The idea of whether the veto is truly justified, which I'll be looking through to two big angles. Firstly, the, 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 the firstly on the issue of equality, and secondly, on the issue of engagement of all nations, large and small. So firstly, on the issue of equality, they bring out a purely idealistic notion of how the purpose of the UN was built behind the issue of representation, where every country gets an equal voice. We told you from the first speaker that that has never been the primary goal of the UN. The UN, having learned from the failures of the past, was set out as an organization that would actually work. An organization that was capable of, of balancing this principle of, of equality with the principle of ensuring that resolutions are passed efficiently. Throughout all three speakers, they never managed to provide a coherent response. And so the idea of whether when large nations do not support resolutions passed by the UNSC, these resolutions simply won't work. We give you time and again examples such as sanctions in North Korea will never work if China decides to go against its standards and continue trading with nations like North Korea. Without the support of these larger nations, these resolutions simply wouldn't work and the credibility of the UN fundamentally will be lost. Essentially, this is why we think there's a necessity to balance equality with efficiency. Yeah. So moving, no thank you madam, moving on to the next issue of allowing for engagement of all nations, large and small. Now we think that side proposition is purely complacent about the international order that we exist in today. Fundamentally, international relations is an anarchy and we need to ensure that countries follow rules as set out in the framework of the UN. There's nothing natural in our situation in our international community today where a delegate from a large powerful nation like the United States is willing to sit at the table and listen to a delegate from a nation like Singapore. We think that the reason why he's willing to sit at the table because he knows that there's absolutely no chance that this delegate from Singapore could compromise on his fundamental interest in any way. This is what keeps him on the table. It's not an issue of the UN deciding to suck up to these nations just because they are larger. It's rather an issue of the UN being realistic enough to realize that we need to provide an incentive for these nations to work within the framework of the UN. They try to simplify this issue and dismiss this issue by telling us that it's not the case as if the veto power will remove tomorrow all countries, all, all the larger nations will immediately quit the UN or stop working within the UN. We already see a trend in the world today of larger nations attempting to work outside the framework of the UN through mechanisms such as the GA and the G12. We think this is a deeply worrying trend and think that your policy will only hasten this trend. When they see no reason to continue working within the framework of the UN, this is when they start working exclusive. I'll take you in a moment, sir. Exclusive small cuts outside the UN that deny smaller nations a say and prevent smaller nations from being engaged. What do you have to say to that, sir? Maybe because the United States and Russia publicly said that they do care about international peace and human rights, they have the, they have to keep their reputations. They have, to have the incentive to stay in the UNSC. What if they are isolated from the rest of the world if they quit the UN. Well, sir, we think that this shows a naivety about international relations. We don't think that Russia and China will ever publicly declare that the UN is not important to them because they are members of the UN. Rather, we need to acknowledge that larger nations always work on a cost-benefit analysis. They look at the cost of being in the UN versus the benefits that they get. Currently, the veto provides a clear benefit for them to continue staying within the UN. Whereas in your situation, when the veto power is taken away from them, they know that their fundamental interests can be compromised upon. 
We gave these statistics of how the veto power has only been used twice since the end of the Cold War. And we see that there are political ramifications for these countries in using the veto power. This is why they only use the veto power when they think there's a fundamental compromise on their interests or sovereignty. This is the extent to which they only use the veto power when they push to these extremes. When you push them to these extremes and you deny them their rights, this is when we create conflict and a problem within the United within the United Nations. This is when we create international bodies that are willing to work outside. The idea that China and the USA will be a kind of party of the United Nations, party of the world, just because they decide to work outside the framework of the UN is completely ridiculous. No country would make China and USA a pariah because simply because they are China and USA. They are the most powerful nations in the world and every country would want to engage with them. However, you deny them an opportunity to do so because these countries would think that it's far better to work in small, elite, exclusive clubs of other larger nations. This is a disturbing trend that we need to reserve, re reverse, if not encourage. So moving on to the next issue of whether the veto power is truly beneficial. Shall we be looking at two main angles? Firstly, the efficacy of resolutions, and secondly, on the issue of compromise that we build in our model today. So, firstly, on the issue of the efficacy of resolutions. They gave us, they gave us examples constantly of countries like Syria and Libya. We do agree with them that it's deeply regrettable the human rights abuses that have occurred in these countries. But we do also need to acknowledge that intervention does not always solve the problem. I'll take you in a moment. So intervention isn't a panacea. And when these large nations have decided that intervention has a far more likelihood of worsening the situation, we don't think that it's possible for you to go against their interests. What do you have to say to that, sir? If military sir? intervention wasn't successful in the first place, then how could a NATO intervene in these countries and have saved these civilians from massacres? How do you respond to that? In the case of the Libyan intervention, we see the nations coming together and deciding that intervention was the best possible situation. In the case of Syria, for example, we see there's a case where the huge, messy civil war that is broken up. And we do see a case where military intervention or non-military intervention clearly wouldn't have been the best situation. It's precisely because these nations know the political cost of the veto power that they only use it when they really feel that these veto, that veto power wouldn't do anything to solve the situation. Even countries like the United States, which are usually willing to intervene in cases of human rights abuses, were unwilling to intervene in Syria. Clearly, they show something. Also, you failed to prove to us how without the, about the three largest out of order, sir, the three largest nations in the world, the US, China, and Russia, how an intervention in Syria or Libya actually have been in any way efficient or effective. We deny the UN its credibility. So moving on to the issue of compromise and consensus. We think that clearly, they feel to they clearly misunderstand this issue. We see within our framework, countries like the US, countries like within your framework, countries like the US, countries like the Russia, form blocks among smaller nations to things like vote by and using their power to consolidate their power among these nations. Rather than our case, countries like the US, China, and Russia have an incentive to engage each other on an international platform and ensure that resolutions they come across reflect the spectrum of ideas across political ideologies and prevents the UN from being polarized. Because I proved to you that the veto is both justified and beneficial, please walk inside opposition for a better UN. <laughs> I come from a small nation of 600 square kilometers. And I also know that the existence of small nations like Singapore is an aberration in 2000 years of human history. And I recognize that it is the existence of a rule based world order that has ensured the survival of nations like mine. 
and the libido is integral to the preservation of this new space more. And it's precisely the type of complacency and unfettered idealism that I think to lead us to return to the imperialism that we saw for the majority of 2,000 years of world history. And that's now consistent done on two of the people. So I'm going to ask that you imagine that you're done Secretary General of the year. He walked up to your office on the 37th floor of the UN headquarters and he looked out the window. He looked at the wall of three copies. What do you see? You see a world where small states are being trampled upon because big powers refuse to engage in an organization which would potentially impinge on their sovereignty and fundamental interests. Across the Pacific, you see Wu Jintao making a cost benefit analysis. He tells himself, he said to UN, I can still trade internationally. I just need to send my one million troops into the South China Sea. He raised the option, would I rather have one more day of good press in the New York Times? Or would I risk the possibility that the UN might authorize intervention in Tibet or Taiwan? His answer is clear. He's going to walk out of the UN. That's why Jawa, the formal equality there across small nations, is meaningless. Because it's not backed up with actual equality in the real world. But more importantly, this is also a world that is sugar happy. Because the knee jerk reaction to any conflict, to any form of human rights abuses, is send in the troops. But yet, in Jawa, Conflict is only going to as in the data. Because when big countries are not involved in such positions, conflict only intensifies. Intervention in Syria will only make things worse if Russia continues to supply arms. 